Success Insight shares the stories of the people with passion and drive who make things happen in the world. Here's your host, Howard Fox. Hello, everybody. This is Howard Fox, and welcome to another episode of the Success Insight podcast. Our guest today is Ben Justison, with an undergraduate degree in English literature and journalism, graduate degrees in journalism, technical writing, and political science, and a PhD in interdisciplinary studies. Ben's career has included stints as a newspaper reporter and foreign service officer for the U.S. Department of State. Today, Ben enjoys a career as a writer and editor. Now, while back in journalism school, Ben discovered and began to research the career of Congressman George Henry White, the last American to represent the state of North Carolina in the U.S. Congress in the 19th century. Ben's research into White's life culminated in his Pulitzer Prize-nominated biography, George Henry White, An Even Chance in the Race for Life. Ben Justison, so happy to have you on the Success Insight podcast to talk about this wonderful body of work of yours. Well, good afternoon, Howard. It's a pleasure to be here today and to talk a little about George Henry White, the man I've spent much of my recent life promoting. He's an interesting fellow, but has not been given quite the historical acclaim he deserves. So my job is to introduce as many people as I can day by day to a man who's a great statesman and someone to remember. Well, let's talk a little bit about George Henry White and his career. And and I am curious, as we kind of lay out the information for our listeners, who he was, how did you get started and find this individual and decide this is a path I want to take. I mean, there's some, uh, there's opportunity here or insight. I mean, our, our show's called success insight. Was there an insight and epiphany that like, there's something here I want to know more about? Well, there, there is exactly. It goes back to my early days as a newspaper reporter. I was working in North Carolina in 1975 and It was during the early civil rights era. There was a press release from the North Carolina Museum of History in Raleigh that my editor came and handed to me and said, make a local story out of this. It was about George White and his three comrades who had served as congressmen from North Carolina after Reconstruction, during and after Reconstruction in the 19th century. I'd never heard of any of them. And I looked at the press release and I scratched my head. There was a local angle, of course, because George White was born in the circulation area of the newspaper for which I was working in Fayetteville. And I had a couple of hours to do it. And so I constructed a story. I thought it was a great story. I didn't realize I was making at least one mistake in it because I said the little village where he had apparently been born no longer existed. We had a few rather unhappy readers who informed my newspaper that it may be small, but it still exists. <laughs> <laughs> so I learned my lesson about making assumptions since I could find nothing about Rosendale, the town itself, which is basically just a, a railroad crossing now. But I became interested in him and Over the years, I was beginning to meet some of the early figures in the civil rights movement, Andrew Young and a few others from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference while I was a reporter, and began to wonder why no one had ever written a book about George White, since there were now blacks in Congress from the South, still not one from North Carolina until 92. And I took it with me to graduate school years later when I was looking for a subject for my master's thesis. I thought, well, George White might be a good idea. I never finished the thesis, and I left graduate school to join the Foreign Service in the 1980s, but I carried the notes from my work into his life around the world with me in a footlocker, and occasionally took them out, dusted them off, looked at them, and said, aha, one day somebody's going to write a book that somebody was me. <laughs> Fantastic. There you go. You know something? There's a saying, when the student is ready, the teacher will be there. But there's, So there's some similar analogy. When you're ready, the book's going to be there for you. That's right. One thing that really jumped out at me as 
I was going through the book and, and I read, I was going from chapter to chapter and really just the complexity uh, and the, the maneuvering that was going on. And one thing dawned on me, Ben, is everything that's going on to everything that went on back during post reconstruction, getting into the Jim Crow era and continues to this very day. Parties have flipped. The Republicans and the the Democrats have flipped. But even within the parties, there's all this maneuvering. And I'm thinking nothing has changed. (laughs) Everything changes, but nothing is nothing is different. Yeah. (laughs) It was amazing. And one thing I was really struck too and I am the analogy, only analogy I have is some of these police shows when there's bad things going on. Let's just leave it at that. But the lead detective has his, there's a room somewhere with all the pictures and the lines connecting the points yes. of this person's related to this person. This person had a partnership or an alliance. And as I was going through the book, that's what was striking me is All of these maneuverings and relationships, having to keep track of that, that must have been one heck of an effort on your part, just uh, and based on information that that footlocker had to have been gathering a lot of papers (laughs) for you to try to keep track of all this. Well, it did. And I I began to learn a lot. One of the uh, marvelous things that any historian can tell you is that the more research you do, the more questions you have. You think you answer some, but you always dig out two or three more that lead you in new directions. I've uh, done that with George White for years. I, I thought that when I published the book in 2001, that that would be the end of my obsession with George White, but I was wrong because then I decided to come out with the second book that listed all his speeches, writings, and letters because I could not get them all into the first book. And then I came out with another book about an organization that he belonged to, the National Afro-American Council, which was an organization predating the NAACP. And even then, that wasn't enough. Ten years later, I'm getting ready to publish yet another book about George White and William McKinley, because their relationship has increasingly fascinated me since William McKinley was president during the time that George White was in Congress. I I think this will be my last book, but I can't be sure of that. You never can tell about the next question. I'll find what George White. Uh, never say never. <laughs> yeah. Well, what's new with George White? <laughs> and can you share with our listeners a little bit of about the backstory, who was George White? And I have some ideas in my head of, and as a coach and somebody very interested in human behavior and psychology, I have a picture in my mind of who he was. But can you share with our listeners the type of individual he was? And obviously, he grew up poor toward in the tail end of the, the Civil War, involved in the Reconstruction. But to tell us a little bit for our listeners, who he was and his evolution. He was born in 1852 in rural North Carolina in Bladen County. His father was a a free man of mixed race who worked as a turpentine field hand and married into a family called the Spaldings in Columbus County. Uh, one of the counties that I worked in when I was uh, a newspaper reporter. He grew up in a, an insular community, I guess. There's no other way to put it. It was a, a, a family of mixed race, black, white, and Indian. And he grew up free, although there's some evidence that he might have actually been the child of a slave. His father was apparently not married to his mother. But his father married into this Spalding family when George was four years old. And at that point, I think everything changed because George White was suddenly exposed to a not prosperous, but more comfortable existence, even within the confines of pre-Civil War segregation. He was allowed to be educated 
by his parents if they hired the school teachers. There were no schools that would cater to black students. And while working in the, he'd work in the uh, turpentine fields by day and come in for at night to go to school or three or four months a year when school was uh, possible, when the fields were calling. He uh, first went to a formal school in uh, 1868, 1869, something like that, when a Freedmen's Bureau school was opened near his home. And he apparently was such considered such a bright an engaging young man that one of the teachers who, uh, itinerant teachers who came through and taught for three or four months, opened a teacher training school about 50 miles away and wanted George as a student. So he sent back for him, and that began this long process of his gaining his own education, uh, going to Howard University right after it opened, and eventually becoming a lawyer. He studied law on his own after while working as a teacher. He's a fascinating man, very, very bright, very driven, very ambitious. And I attribute much of his success to his stepmother, who absolutely wanted him to get every educational advantage that was possible. Some of the words that I would use for George White were principled, driven, the taking to the education and, and realizing the importance of education and training and, and really doing the hard work to accomplish what he did. I mean, that comes through in, in your writings about him. And, uh, and I do have to admit, by the way, I had a, you know, I, we, we know or have heard of the North Carolina, the Tar Heels. Mm-hmm. Heaven knows I'm a Midwestern boy. I had no idea where that came from. And <laughs> so I actually, and thank heavens for Google, I started doing research on Tar Heels. <laughs> I now know how to make turpentine. That's hard. That's hard backbreaking work. It is. Yes, it is. <laughs> and he, he was a very uh, strong young man. He was also a rather large individual. He was uh, right. very, worked very hard and I think was never ashamed of that because he always worked all his life. It's hard to stop him once he got started. I was thinking it just definitely has a point of view, like if he sees out in front of him, here's what I want to accomplish. I want to do this. I want to be a teacher. I want to better myself, better my family, better my community. And he literally was, it sounds to me, very driven individual and was able to accomplish that. And, and I think that's some people, you know, a little bit of failure and okay, I'm that's good. I tried and I'm not going to try anymore, but he was just very driven and almost to the point of there was no obstacle he was not willing to, to, to go after if he felt it was the right thing to do. Well, that's quite true. He, he was the master of reinventing himself when either he grew tired or thought he had accomplished everything he could in one area, school teaching and being a principal. He entered politics and entered the law as well. And then he said, well, why not be a public servant as well? So he happened to be lucky enough to live at that time in a small city called New Bern, North Carolina, on the coast above Wilmington. And as a majority black town, it also had a majority Republican voter base. And they said, George White, he was like a good possibility. Let's put him into the state legislature. So they did. And that's what started his career, as uh, ended in Congress. But uh, after serving in both state houses, he became a an elected prosecutor or solicitor, as they called it, for a district of counties in northeastern North Carolina, the only black elected solicitor in the country at the time, and did it for eight years. So at the end of that, he decided he wanted to go to Congress. All of this time, I think he was revisiting the best way to serve both himself and his race. He was a very principled fellow. He he tried very hard to do things the right way, 
but whenever someone threw a, an obstacle in his path, he figured out a way to get around it. And he even, while he was solicitor, he ended up meeting some of the more distinguished white lawyers in court, and they never forgot that. They're thinking, wait a minute, this is just some kid from the swamps of southeastern North Carolina. How did he get to be so smart? And he, he just kept on going. He said, and this is my my mission is to serve my people and others, not just uh, blacks, but all North Carolinians in any way that he could. One of the things that I, I, I find amazing in the book title, it really brings it out is that George Henry White, I don't know what you would call the second secondary headline and even chance in the race of life. And mm -hmm. at the end of the day, that is what he was looking for. I just want to be recognized for who I am, my capabilities, my, my, my strengths, the, the things that I am bringing to society, to my people. Yep. And when faced with obstacles, as you just said, he would find a way around that obstacle. He did. He was uh, truly an amazing fellow. I, the reason I think I've stayed so fascinated by him is that there's always something new to learn about him, something that he, when he did something that failed or did something that was politically not practical, he learned how to take his lumps and get up and keep going. And uh, my best example is uh, in 1894, he decided he wanted to run for Congress. And his brother-in-law, he and his wife and his brother-in-law's wife or sisters, had been in Congress for two terms before and had been defeated in uh, 1892 and decided to come back and run in 1894. Well, George White wanted the seat as well. So he ended up fighting with the man who should have been his best friend, his brother-in-law, over the nomination. And it was not a great story because they ended up being estranged for a long time over this rather rancorous nomination that eventually they had to call in national political leaders to assign the nomination to Henry Cheatham, his brother-in-law, and not to him. George White thought about it and thought about it and thought about it. And two years later, he came back and he figured out how to beat his brother-in-law the next time for the nomination. He was determined and he kept, and they became friends again eventually. But uh, it was tough going there for a while. <laughs> oh, something I'm curious about too is as I was doing some, you know, the, again, the reading in the book, doing some of the, re the research that is out on, on the internet, and mm -hmm. it, it, it makes it sound like he, for the sake of a better choice of words, and I apologize in advance because you know much more about him than I will ever know, but there seems to be this implication that life was a, in some ways a failure. I don't know why I, I feel that way. But I look at it as he was not a failure. He was very principled. And I think it's almost as though you stop fighting when you know it's something that's just not worth it anymore. But I can do I can do just as good doing something else. So when he left Congress, he went back and he worked on issues related to the to the advancement of the colored people. You've got the Brotherhood, et cetera, the 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 founders of the civil rights movement, what what or what it originally became. So he really was taking those principles and very successful at it. And so there wasn't really no failure here. I think you, you've captured his essence very well. What looks to failure as failure to other people is not failure at all. It's just a, a demand that he reorient himself, execute a workaround, find something else in his life that he can do. When he could no longer be in Congress, he said, well, then I'll become a lawyer again. I'll start a, a business, he did in Washington. Then he started developing land in New Jersey. Then he moved to Philadelphia, and he was the equivalent of the Energizer Bunny, as far as I'm concerned. He never stopped. He was always looking for something. Um, mind you, he did need money. And one of the reasons that he had to leave North Carolina after 1900 was that he could not make the kind of money he had once made as a lawyer. That was just, uh, the door was closed to that under Jim Crow. 
So he said, well, if I can't make it here, I'll make it in Washington or Philadelphia. And then he opened a bank in Philadelphia. He did all these amazing things that no one could have predicted. Uh, at the end of his life, I think he he was done in by financial circumstances. His bank failed, and he had to go back to work at the very end of his life, just before he died, as a, an assistant city solicitor in Philadelphia. But he never stopped. I mean, he was still working the day before he died. So I find him an incredible example of someone who never gave up, no matter how dark the times got. He kept moving and kept plugging away at anything that he could do to advance his own situation while advancing you know, the situations of those around him. In the leadership development field, there's lots of conversations about what makes a great leader. And one of the consistent themes is a great leader learns from their mistakes. They're not, they're not afraid to make a mistake. And if they do, they determine what is that lesson I need to learn? How do I prevent it from recurring? And I would suspect that George White could also be described as a great leader too, because even when there was an obstacle, perhaps things did not work out as he had planned. He put the boots back on, buckle up the belt and walk out the door and said, what's next? That, that's the mark of a leader. I think it's a good characterization of his attitude. I, I know that he did try to go back to into politics one time after he moved to Philadelphia. A congressman in Philadelphia died, and they had a special election, so George White decided he would seek the Republican nomination. He did not get it. He just there weren't enough voters in Philadelphia to give him the nomination, but he, he tried, tried his best and said, well, I guess it's just not my time. He had predicted when he was leaving Congress that African-Americans would come back to Congress at some point, like a phoenix you know, rising from the ashes. It wasn't him. It was actually someone from Chicago, of all places, who was the next black Republican to serve in Congress in 1929. But George White set the pace. Had he not done what he did, I don't think, had he not made that prediction, said, all right, it's up to you. If, if I can't be the one, then somebody else will have to do it. He's just an inspirational guy, I guess. Yeah, and when this the script, the documentary that you produced, which, by the way, folks, will share with you the links to the documentary that Ben produced, American Phoenix, that was produced in 2012. I mean, there's, there's that little snippet there of Barack, President Barack Obama. And, I mean, you don't get any better than that prediction from George White when you're the President of the United States. <laughs> They do not. I, th I think you're exactly right. I, I know when the president's office contacted me in 2009 to get a little background information on George Floyd so the president could use it in his speech, I was just fascinated by it, how careful they were to make sure that everything that was going in the speech was exactly right. It was all historically accurate. And... I I watched it, and I, I, every time I watch that little documentary, I, I see this one wonderful moment when he's addressing the Congressional Black Caucus, and he said, the gentleman from North Carolina rose to give this speech at the end of his career, and I'm thinking, hmm, if he could only have seen 100 years in the future <laughs> that his words were, in fact, true, he wouldn't have believed it. Or he might have believed it, but he would have been shaking his head going, I never thought it would go that far. <laughs> it actually brings up a, another question is mm -hmm. this, your second book was in his own writings, speeches and letters of George Henry White. Yeah. Putting yourself in those, within those writings and, and in George White's head, what would you say would be on his mind today looking at how far, or perhaps not how far we should, how far we've come, or perhaps we still have a lot far, farther to go. Because I, sus I suspect we still have a lot farther to go, just given the state of our country today. What do you think he would say, just based on what you could glean from his writings? 
Well, I think he would be probably the leader of a black independent movement rather than being aligned with either party. He had started counseling his readers and followers in the years after he left Congress to be more assertive about being independent. Although he was a Republican, died in the wool and would never leave, he understood that uh, many black voters were starting to drift away from the Republican Party. And he wanted people to maximize their leverage, to use independent thought. I think he would probably say something along that line today. Don't be too sure. Don't paint yourself into a corner. Make yourself at home in both parties and as independents. I think he would be very surprised to find that all, almost all black voters today are Democrats. He would understand why, but he would still be surprised. And he would say, you, you may not have you know, taken my advice quite as liberally as I wanted you to. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you've, you've gone from one side of the spectrum to the other. <laughs> I think he'd be fascinated by the number of black officials in the South and very saddened by the fact that we don't seem to have moved as far past the the racial divide as we thought we did. He would probably tell people to um, stress getting an education. He would push them to obey the law, not to to break it. And when it's wrong, protest against it, yes, but keep obeying it until it's changed. His advice would probably echo a little bit of Martin Luther King in that respect. Civil disobedience is fine, but you must pay the consequences if you you know really want to make a difference. And I think he would want most of all people to work as hard as they possibly can. I I, I do. He was not a fan of anything like the welfare state, and he would not. He believed in self-help. He was an entrepreneur, and he would never have taken help from anybody, although I think he would understand why people need government assistance occasionally. He would say, take it for a short time and get off it, because you'll never make anything of yourself. That would be his attitude. And that might perhaps put a target on his back from some of his fellow leaders who would say, aha, you you really are a conservative at heart, aren't you? And and he was. He was a conservative man. That's another description that that was coming across to me as going through the book is that conservative leanings, definitely the believing in the education, hard work, perseverance, persistence, and... I, also, as a coach, I, I do a lot of work with personality instruments. I, I use an instrument called the disc. I don't know if you've ever been exposed to it. Yeah, I have. I'm thinking, what what disc preference would George Henry White be? And I, I was thinking, probably somewhere in the C, in the C conscientious, maybe leaning a little bit more towards the dominance, the D, because I think he had a firm beliefs in what is right and what is wrong and really expecting others to behave the way he would want them to behave. I think you're right. He was not a punitive fellow, but he had been a prosecutor and he certainly had no problem with putting people in jail when they did things that were wrong. But he wanted the process to be fair. And I believe he was um, one of the reasons he was so determined to end lynching if he could because he thought that was the most unfair thing that this country could do was to take somebody's life without benefit of a trial. He always said he favored capital punishment, but only if you had a fair trial. So, Ben, let's talk about what's next for you in the the life of George White. Well, as I mentioned earlier, I've been examining his friendship relationship with William McKinley, in my next book, which is really hard to dig out in my research. I've worked on this six or seven years, and most of it is digging around in old newspapers because there really aren't many letters between the two men. But newspapers in Washington and elsewhere did always point to McKinley's willingness to listen to black advisors, to call them in, to meet with white. 
a lot and to a point. White nominated uh, nearly 40 black postmasters in North Carolina while he was in Congress, and all of them had to be vetted or um, approved by the White House. So he was meeting with uh, McKinley fairly regularly, I think at least a dozen times in the, the first two years White was in Congress, which was unheard of for a black congressman to have that kind of entree to the White House. To me, what, what emerged during my research was that McKinley was a far more far-sighted, uh, visionary leader in race than people have given him credit for. I don't think he could have done nearly as much as he did without White to sort of be his conscience, his, I call him his prophet, his impetus for the kinds of actions he wanted. And he couldn't accomplish everything that George White wanted him to do, but he did a lot more than he's gotten credit for. So that became the reason behind the book was to show both their relationship and what it accomplished and what it did not accomplish, what it, at least the questions that it raised, and to understand that George White was truly trying to be a good representative of both his race and the American system. Not a gadfly, but a reminder, a constant reminder. That's good, you've done this, but there is more to do. I hope that the book will point that out. <laughs> yeah, there, there's an old Jewish proverb that you're at uh, tikkun olam. You're not obligated to complete the task, but neither are you free to abandon it. And it sounds like George White would just, he knew it was perhaps not going to be completed in his lifetime, but he laid the groundwork for continuing the hard work that was that was ahead and in the work that he did in the moment. I think that proverb would have been perfect on his gravestone or in his headstone, and uh, he's buried outside Philadelphia. And uh, maybe I'll go put a sign up on it saying, and by the way, <laughs> <laughs> this proverb sums him up. <laughs> yeah. So I have a, a couple more questions for you here. Because I'm curious today. 2020 is is right around the corner. Your book is going to be published in 2020. This new book, uh, Forgotten Legacy, William McKinley and George Henry White and the Struggles for Black Equality. What do you think his constituents or the his admirers, because I mean, the goal here, Ben, is to raise people's awareness, at least I think it's a goal, raise people's awareness of George Henry White and really the, play, the place, the rightful place he has in the annals of history, especially as it relates to being African American and coming out of the Civil War and into Reconstruction and the eras that came after that but because he deserves to be known and talked about and studied what do you think people would say today when they're introduced to the story of george henry white most people who hear about him for the first time when i talk about him just are shaking their heads going he must have this wrong i mean this couldn't have been he couldn't have been this famous a guy back then and i've never heard of him but i have found that there are many African Americans who knew about him, but you know, they learned about him in school, among others. There were you know, 22 black congressmen from the South, or 20 in the House, and two from the Senate. Uh, during the same period, he was just the last one. I think what they would learn from hearing about him again is that it really was a more interesting and more uh, fascinating era than, than I thought, because blacks were actually imported. They were famous. George White was quite famous all around the country for four years. And, and then as soon as he left Congress, the uh, uh, historians began digging his grave and pushing him into it, which is, uh, I've spent, more than 20 years uh, uncovering everything I can about him to find out that one of the reasons they had to bury him was that it was hard to explain why the Jim Crow era happened in the South and why blacks had lost the vote in the South for more than 50 years. And 
why things had to go through, had to go down, and then come up again. But what they don't realize until they hear it from me, I think, is that George White said, well, you know, it's, it's not going to be easy. Nothing's going to be easy, but that doesn't mean you can give up. You can't give up. You know, it, it may be a long time coming. So here, it's like fast forwarding George White on one side of the divide and Barack Obama and the 40 odd African American members of Congress today on the other. And all this time in between when this just this almost a vacuum when they weren't allowed, you know, that to me is to flesh out history in a way that makes people think differently about it. It's easy to condemn everything that happened in the 19th century if you don't understand it. If you do understand it, then it's easy easier to make sure that it never happens again. But if you don't understand it, you're doomed to repeat it. That's what I tell my students. And I hate to say it, but I think at least given the current climate where we seem to be repeating a couple things here and there. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, I think you're, you're right. It's um, yeah. people haven't learned as much as they thought they had. No. I wish they'd learn a little more. Yeah. So let them come take my course. There you go. There you go. So Ben, <laughs> if our listeners would like to learn more about you, your work, especially George Henry White, where are the best places for them to go? Well, the best place to start would probably be a website called uh, www.georgehenrywhite.com that's run by uh, a nonprofit foundation in North Carolina. I write for it uh, as often as they ask me to. and We have many things posted, biographies and uh, past stories about him. There is a movement in North Carolina to reclaim George Henry White's legacy by the Spalding Foundation. To they've renamed a, a, a community center, a health education, health and education center in Bladen County, in his name, in order to use him as a, a reminder and and as a force for good, force for positive, uh, constructive work to help people raise themselves up, to help them economically and educationally and medically if they can, without making them, it's not charity, you know, it's hard work, but this foundation is determined to do it because they think George White is the good symbol. And I agree. I'll keep saying that until I can't say it anymore. There you go. And we appreciate you coming on to the Success Insight podcast to introduce to our listeners, George Henry White. And so, Ben, we appreciate you taking the time and we will put links back to the website, George Henry White. Also, we've got a link back to Amazon for the book and on to your LinkedIn profile. And I know myself, I'm looking forward to the new book getting published next year, which is pretty, it's only a couple of days away. And so we'll get you back on, hopefully, so you can talk about George Henry White and the, the relationship with President McKinley. Hopefully that'll be in the cards in the future as well. So thank you so much. It was a great conversation today. Thank you so much for having me. It's uh... It's always good to talk about him, and you're making an invitation that I, I can not resist taking you up on again. So we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll talk again in a few months. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. Folks, there you have it. We have been chatting with Ben Justison. He is a historian, a writer, editor, and we have been discussing really I would say almost Ben's life work, which has been into researching the life of George Henry White. And the book is George Henry White, An Even Chance in the Race of Life. And just a great, probably one of the first autobiographical novels I've read, believe it or not, in all my years. And so it's not all about fiction and nonfiction, but it's nice to read an autobiography. And 
very interesting and it's nice that reading generates other interests and other discoveries and I that's what was really uh, I thought fascinating about the events leading up to our discussion with Ben so we hope you enjoyed today's discussion and remember like we say every episode wherever you are whatever you're doing go out there have a phenomenal day and we'll see you on the next episode of the Success Insight Podcast take care now Success Insight is a production of Fox Coaching and First Story Strategies Find us online, successinsightpodcast.com. 